Welcome to Global Ethics Weekly. I'm Alex Woodson from Carney Council in New York City. Today I'm speaking with Molly O'Toole. Molly is an immigration and security reporter for the Los Angeles Times based in the Washington DC Bureau. Molly recently won the first ever Pulitzer Prize in audio reporting along with the staff of This American Life and freelancer Emily Green for The Outcrowd. This podcast investigated the personal impact of the Trump administration's Remain in Mexico policy. We'll speak about that today and some of the other issues around migration in the US, including coronavirus and family separation. And one with some thoughts about the George Floyd protests, which Molly has also covered. Thank you so much for speaking today, Molly. I'm glad we were able to do this. Uh, congratulations on the Pulitzer, first of all. Thank you. Uh, listen to Remain in Mexico, it's great. I encourage everyone to, to listen to that. So I'd like to start there. Um, for people that might not have been following this as closely as you, what is the Remain in Mexico policy exactly? It's actually pretty self-explanatory given given that name, um, and that's sort of the informal name for the policy. Uh, the the administration has its own term, which is called the Migrant Protection Protocols, which is a pretty ironic name uh, once you dig into what the policy actually does. So, in December of 2018, uh, then Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, um, sort of out of the blue, um, somewhat. Uh, in a committee announced this policy that really dramatically changes um, U.S. immigration policy, in particular asylum. And, and what this policy does is it essentially says, um, under U.S. law, um, migrants who come to the border, however they come to the border, uh, who are physically there, whether at a port of entry, an official entry point, or between ports of entry, they have the right to seek asylum. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to get it necessarily, and actually very few do, um, but they have the right to seek asylum. And every other administration, uh, really, the practice has been to allow people to wait inside the United States, where they are, most of them already are. Um, in order to see that process through while their asylum claim is adjudicated. And that often takes quite a long time because there's a immense backlog uh, in the immigration courts. But what this policy did is it forced those people back to Mexico. It forced them to wait in Mexico, in border towns along, uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, but border towns in Mexico, uh, through the duration of that process. Uh, and at this stage, depending on sort of whose estimates you use, um, even uh, the Department of Homeland Security um, says that it's about 60,000 people who went in, uh, who became part of this program and were forced back to Mexico. That, and that's just since it was begun to be implemented around in late January of 2019. So it's still ongoing. So what, is, what are the conditions like in those border towns for the migrants? Not great is, the, is yeah. the short version. Um, I mean, basically the system was not set up for this. Um, Mexico wasn't prepared for it. At first they denied uh, that they had agreed to this policy. And then they, they stated very explicitly that they did not agree that this was unilaterally imposed by the United States. And Kirsten Nielsen said herself that it was unilaterally um, being imposed by the United States. But Mexico actually ends up taking the brunt of it um, because these are, um, migrants being sent back to Mexico who are, in, in most cases, although it was expanded further, they're not Mexican, they're Central American migrants. And, and the Trump administration had sort of floated in one of its first executive orders that they were going to push essentially all migrants back to Mexico. Um, but there are agreements in place, there are laws in place that state, and Mexico disputed it then, saying we don't have to take people who are not our citizens. So Mexico was not set up uh, to handle this, especially tens of thousands of people. And then you have to combine that um, with the thousands of people who were already waiting at ports of entry because of this policy referred to as metering, which was essentially the Trump administration just not letting people in um, who were trying to come to ports of entry and make a claim. So you've got tens of thousands of people essentially sort of backed up in border cities um, many of which don't have an infrastructure. They might have a few shelters that are mostly run by churches, not run by the government, um, run by nonprofits. Um, so a lot of people essentially were on the streets uh, in, in some of the most dangerous cities in the world, um, according to our own government. Um, and so these sort of de facto uh, impromptu uh, refugee camps um, have popped up along the border. And um, while reduced in size um, now, uh, many of them still exist. And there are basically no 
resources uh, and U.S. officials stated explicitly that it basically once they were pushed back to Mexico, it wasn't their problem. Have you been to refugee camps in the Middle East or in other parts of the world? I have actually. Um, I uh, worked for Foreign Policy magazine and covered the last presidential election uh, and then in the after the first few months of the Trump administration in the spring of 2017, I actually went abroad for almost two years um, freelancing and um, still looking at migration and security um, at those themes uh, that I still cover now and sort of have always covered in one way or another. Um, so that I worked in South Asia, I worked in West Africa, um, on the Turkey-Syria border, for example. Um, so I have been to I have been to some of those camps and, and seen sort of uh, refugee situations in different parts of the world. And sort of what's unique about these on on the border, the U.S.-Mexico border, is that they're informal. Uh, at least in some of the other refugee camps, I mean, they're they're organized or run by the UN. Um, there's more of a system in in place. Not always, um, but also you know, even in fast developing refugee situations, um, that infrastructure eventually develops. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, both the United States and Mexico and the UN um, were sort of intentionally not formalizing the situation because the UN disputed that, that it was legal or that it should be allowed to happen. And so they were concerned that if they provided those resources, it will be sort of putting the stamp of approval on it. And then the US and Mexico both wanted to wash, essentially wash their hands of the situation that their policies intentionally created. And part of it, and, and Trump administration officials have been explicit about this, um, was to make people give up on their asylum claims and go home. Uh, they're very explicit that remain in Mexico is a deterrent. And in fact, they, um, they tout it, they, they brag about it as being one of the most successful policies towards the administration's goals um, of, um, of deterring really all migration. And, and it should be noted that asylum is, you know, people like to put immigration in these, um, it's a very, obviously a very heated political issue in the United States. And we sort of like to put it in these categories of good migrant, bad migrant, you know, uh, good immigration, bad immigration, legal immigration, illegal immigration. And there, there's a lot of gray areas, but it should be noted that asylum is a form of legal immigration. Um, it is a, a, afforded under US law. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying that how, how this situation, this refugee situation is unique um, on the U.S.-Mexico border as opposed to other, other contexts. Uh, and and it, it has a very international uh, demographic, actually. A lot of people just think of Central Americans, and in many ways, many of the Trump administration's policies attempting to restrict immigration target Central Americans specifically. Um, but it, it's quite international. If you go to Tijuana or Juarez, um, you have a lot of um, refugees from West Africa, from East Africa, from Central Asia, um, from all over the world, because in many ways, access to refugee status, which you can only get outside of the United States, those programs have been, have been shrunk to almost nothing, um, both in the US and Europe as well. Um, and so people are increasingly taking this incredible journey, an incredibly dangerous journey, to get to the U.S.-Mexico border and then find themselves stuck in this sort of international waiting room. I'm not sure if this is something you've covered, but what happens if someone requests asylum at the Canadian border? Are, are they, I, I don't think there's a remaining Canada policy, but is that, what happens to someone from East Africa, maybe that, that shows up, uh, you know, in Buffalo or, or a place like well, that? What's, well, what's tricky about, about that um, is because um, obviously, so refugee status, someone could apply to uh, apply for refugee status in Canada from outside of Canada. Although the way that, that the refugee program works, and it's almost 99% administered by the UN, um, people don't get to choose where they go. Uh, and I think a lot of people misunderstand that. Um, you don't necessarily get to choose where you go. Um, and so it's sort of this, this it, it's almost as if it's sort of like a lottery. It's not like people apply necessarily directly to be placed in the United States or to be placed in Canada. Now, if they have family and that, that's sort of a different yeah. process, but in terms of asylum, you would have, and this isn't something I've covered so much on the Canadian border, but uh, they, P authorities have seen that. Um, basically people, using the way that Mexico is used as basically the largest transit 
country in the world for migration. Um, they're using the United States as a transient country um, in order to try and seek asylum in Canada because they would still have to physically present themselves. Um, but, um, you know, the U.S. and Canada have an actual legitimate safe third country agreement. Um, and that works both directions. Um, so in almost all circumstances, they would not be able to seek asylum in Canada having passed through the United States because the way that agreement would work is that they would have to seek asylum in the United States first. Uh, now, what, what the Trump administration has done is, as, is it's essentially tried to make the entire world a safe third country without the rest of the world agreeing, um, saying that if any migrant has passed through any country before getting to the United States, they're ineligible for asylum in the United States um, because they should have claimed asylum in that other country first. Now, those agreements aren't in place. Um, and the very nature of that agreement would be that both countries would have to agree. Um, so you can't really legally or logistically implement a safe third country agreement on the entire world without those partner countries actually agreeing. And you have to certify that that country is in fact a safe country. Mm -hmm. um, and the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State have sort of given their um, signature and said, oh, oh, we certify it's a safe country. But at the same time, you have State Department warnings um, that are saying that they're among the most dangerous you know, places or countries in the world. Some of these countries that they pass through, whether the Northern Triangle or Mexico itself, um, so there's clearly a, a contradiction uh, in U.S. policy and, and U.S. assessments of what is safe. So as you said, the Remain in Mexico policy continues today. Uh, what's the status of legal challenges against the Remain in Mexico policy? Uh, I want to get to what you specifically reported on your podcast in, in a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But it seemed like one of the asylum officers had a had a legal background and he noted many different legal problems with not just moral problems, but actual legal problems with this Remain in Mexico policy. So where, where is that now? Right, and, and I'm glad you pointed that out because uh, asylum officers have been much maligned by the Trump administration, but many of them are lawyers. Many of them have this intimate grasp of immigration law, which is incredibly complex in a way that I could never hope to. Um, and so they have a really in-depth understanding of, of immigration law. Interestingly, where that case stands now, um, and depending on when this comes out, I mean, we just we just had a Supreme Court ruling uh, with with DACA, which was I think surprised a lot of, of a lot of people, um, and was a real interesting. It's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how that sort of um, impacts the Trump administration's calculus for many of these other immigration policies, like Remain in Mexico, um, which are still under litigation. Um, the Supreme Court essentially, um, I believe it was in March, basically declined to take, take this up, to take Remain in Mexico up, uh, which sort of left it um, back with a lower court uh, and basically said, we want this to work its way through the lower courts first. Um, so this litigation is ongoing. And the foundation of the lawsuits against Remain in Mexico um, is that it violates all sorts of law, um, one being the Administrative Procedures Act, which sounds really boring and bureaucratic, but it's actually at the heart of the, the DACA ruling just now, which is essentially that, um, you know, that the administration violated all of the ways that Congress has said that they're required to take some of these policy actions. Um, and among some of those issues are, are really specific with Remain in Mexico, but for example, uh, only providing forms in English and not providing translations or providing really bad translations that aren't certified in any way or um, sending no you know they're supposed to put down an address and so that notices and updates about cases about cases can the that the applicant can receive them um, which is particularly notable amid coronavirus because these hearings have been just pushed back pushed back pushed back pushed back they don't have addresses they live on the street um, um, because that's the situation they've been forced into by the U.S. government. So bogus addresses were being put on these important forms, and there was basically no way to get a notification about your, um, about your hearing. And then what that often results in is um, an applicant or, or a migrant being ordered removed in, a, in absentia without even knowing it. And, and the irony of that being that they're not actually physically present in the United States, they're in Mexico, so they're being ordered removed even though they've already been removed. 
Um, but that could potentially block you from getting access to asylum or a legal immigration status in the United States for a certain period of time or ever. Um, so these administrative aspects of Remain in Mexico that, that were being challenged and were a foundation of the lawsuit, they really do matter. And then there's a sort of fundamental um, legal theory, uh, which isn't just theory, it's, it's codified in international agreements that the U.S. is a signatory to, uh, as well as the Immigration and Nationality Act and, and other found the foundation of U.S. immigration law, which is this principle of non-refoulement. I won't even attempt to do the French uh, pronunciation of that. But it's essentially that you, the U.S. government cannot send someone, knowingly send someone back to harm. And in this case, it's the U.S. government not sending people back to their home countries, but sending them back to Mexico, um, and very much knowing that they're sending them back to harm. And so that's sort of the foundation of those lawsuits. But where it stands is that it's still under litigation. Um, the administration, I believe it was the Ninth Circuit, uh, an appeals panel that basically said that the administration could continue to implement the policy while um, essentially they, they ultimately ruled on sort of the legality of it. And, and when, the, um, when the Supreme Court essentially dodged and, and said, you know, we're gonna let you guys work it out, that's sort of where it stands. So the administration has continued to implement the policy, still continues to implement the policy, even now with the border essentially being closed uh, in the name of coronavirus, um, Remain in Mexico uh, is ongoing with the same legal issues um, that have existed throughout the program. And, and the foundation of the Trump administration's defense of the program, um, that, that it, gives, it actually gives people access to asylum. They do have access to credible fear interviews. Um, if they really are afraid or have demonstrated why they can't go back to Mexico, they could be allowed to stay. None of those things are actually none of those things are actually true. Um, they also claim that there were exceptions that people who the policy would not be applied to them, um, and that has also proven consistently to not be the case. Um, so even the the foundation of the Ninth Circuit's um, decision that said that they could be allowed to continue implementing this policy. Um, has also proven false. So it'll be interesting to see what ultimately happens, but I also think there's a run out the clock aspect to this. Yeah. Um, so turning to specifically uh, the out crowd now, um, you spoke with uh, several asylum officers um, and most of them, and maybe all of them were, seemed very troubled by, by what they had to go through in, in these interviews. Uh, I believe one quit and um, sent, sent a series of memos. So is, is this our, what's the status right now with asylum officers? As you said, a lot of them are, are lawyers that understand asylum law very well. A lot of them have moral concerns as well as legal concerns. Is, what, what's the status of, of, uh, of their concerns and, and how many are left basically? Um, well, there was, our reporting included and, and other reporting that sort of talked about, um, you know, asylum officers being troubled by many of, of the administration policies that have been put in place. And you think it, it makes sense if you think about it. Their job is to administer asylum. They work for an administration that fundamentally does not believe in asylum and, and thinks of it as a loophole um, that people are gaming. Um, so it, 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 from the very outset, put asylum officers and the administration at odds. Um, but many were particularly troubled by the remain in Mexico policy for both ethical and legal reasons, the legal reasons, some of which we've laid out, um, but in part because people were telling them that they had already been, you know, raped, kidnapped, assaulted in Mexico as a direct result of the U.S. government putting them there, forcing them there. Um, and yet it was sort of there, it was on, the, it was the sort of blood was on their hands, so to speak, for lack of like a more artful phrase. Um, they were the ones sending them back personally. It was them, they, it was mm -hmm. their job um, to send them back. And they felt very much in a bind that the policy left them no other choice if they were to administer the policy as they were being told to. Um, so at the time, um, you know, a lot of um, asylum officers were quitting or resigning or you know using up all their sick time to basically avoid having to do this policy um and this sort of ongoing battle and the the union that represents the asylum officers um 
had also filed an amicus brief basically at, in the litigation against Remain in Mexico saying that they didn't agree with it and they believed that it was illegal, um, which was a, a pretty uh, significant step. Now they've been pretty actively vocal since then, but that, that was a pretty significant step that they did. Um, so that sort of dynamic has essentially continued. Um, yeah. You know, now we have USCIS, um, the administration claims that they're $1.2 billion in the hole. And, and what should be noted is that as opposed to other immigration agencies like CBP um, or ICE, um, they're funded, um, you know, they're funded sort of through the normal budgetary process of government where they, you know, the White House makes a request, Congress considers the request, Congress ultimately appropriates a certain amount of money. But USCIS is, is which is, um, sorry, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, the agency that houses asylum and asylum officers, um, it's a fee-based agency, which means that, um, you know, if you're an applicant, if you're applying for a green card, um, for example, um, you have to pay fees and those fees are what fund the agency. But if you have an administration that fundamentally believes, that does not believe that immigrants are entitled to benefits, uh, even legal, um, people who are in the United States legally, uh, and you have an agency whose fundamental job is to administer the legal immigration system and provide those benefits, you've also created a scenario in which um, they no longer have fees because they've essentially stopped doing all of these, um, uh, administering all of these these processes and so there's um, the administration claims that if they don't get this money from Congress that they're going to be furloughing or laying off you know 15,000 USCIS employees and, and it's you can't really um, extricate the political dynamic from that and this idea that they they really don't want asylum officers to be doing their job anyway so that's sort of where things stand at USCIS so surprisingly, uh, we haven't, none of us have brought up the COVID pandemic yet. Um, that's had a huge effect on immigration. I was just looking through your stories uh, since March. All of the immigration stories have, have uh, been impacted by COVID in some way. Uh, so I know we only have a limited amount of time, but there's a lot to get into there. There's the family separation. There's uh, coronavirus patients being sent back to Guatemala, mm -hmm. um, how it's affected remain in Mexico. So. I guess my question is, how have you really seen COVID affect, we'll say on Remain in Mexico for the matter of time, so how have you seen COVID affect uh, the Remain in Mexico policy as, as you've been reporting on it? There's a few significant ways. Um, Remain in Mexico has continued, um, and, but um, hearings, so basically people who are in Remain in Mexico are given an, a notice to appear, and they usually go through sort of three or four rounds of hearings that are several months apart. So you have people who have been at, at waiting in Mexico, remaining in Mexico, um, just to sort of get their asylum claims even heard by a, a judge um, more than a year. Um, and that was already happening, um, that, that sort of really lengthy delay. And they have to come back to the border every time for, you know, for that hearing, they're brought across for the hearing and then they're brought back and sort of just dumped, dumped back into Mexico. Um, so it was already taking quite a long time. And part of the administration's argument for this policy was, this is a way that we can adjudicate asylum claims really quickly. We'll do it in, in just a, a very short period of time. Um, and that was the part of the foundation of why this policy was allowed to go forward, which clearly isn't true because you have people waiting. So now with coronavirus, um, both types of, of immigration court cases, which is the detained docket and the non-detained docket, meaning people who are in immigration detention and who are not in immigration detention, um, both types have had been impacted by coronavirus because a lot of the immigration courts were essentially shut down. I mean, basically the immigration justice system, which you, I wouldn't even really refer to that, but it's under the, refer to it that way, but it's under the Department of Justice, basically ground to a halt with coronavirus. And, and there are reasons for that. You can see clearly, I mean, there were courtrooms where there were documented cases of coronavirus, immigration judges, uh, attorneys. It was a really rare circumstance in which ICE attorneys and, um, and immigration attorneys uh, came together to say, please close the courts um, because you're putting everyone in danger and the public, whoever they come into contact with. Um, so for people under Remain in Mexico, what it's essentially meant is there was already, they were already waiting so long 
Um, and this is sort of trying to follow the process the right way, uh, the quote unquote right way, um, trying to go through the process uh, legally and, and, and see the whole process through. Um, they're for being forced to wait even longer. And now they're being forced to wait even longer in refugee camps, essentially, or the ones who are lucky enough to sort of be in an apartment or a hotel uh, where the conditions are also really bad. Um, the conditions are ripe for coronavirus. <laughs> but they're being forced to wait even longer in a situation in which they're incredibly vulnerable to getting coronavirus. And we already there are already documented cases in which um, people removed by the United States under this new expulsions policy, which basically, as a short version, they're citing a controversial CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, order to say that essentially that asylum is paused, protections for unaccompanied minors are paused, everything is paused, we're just going to turn people back really quickly because of this incredible risk of migrants bring, bringing in coronavirus, um, of which there's almost no, they, they've cited two cases so far, I believe. Mm. Um, and the United States being, you know, the epicenter of the world for coronavirus and for a long time, you know, had many more cases than Mexico or Central America. There have already been cases in which they've shown that people removed from the United States, either right over the border in those northern border cities, have coronavirus. So they're actually bringing it to these camps that people are essentially stuck in because of U.S. policy. Um, and then also, of course, we have these examples in which the U.S. is removing people all the way back to either southern Mexico or Central America, in which, the, for example, Guatemala alone, the majority of Guatemala's coronavirus cases can be directly attributed to deportees from the United States. Um, so this, this is, these are the ways in which um, coronavirus is, is impacting immigration. And, and in the name of coronavirus, citing coronavirus, even when the health, the public health justification is really nebulous, the Trump administration is taking really dramatic steps that they've been very explicit that they've wanted to take throughout the entirety of the administration. They're doing it now, um, either citing public health and coronavirus or sort of under the cover of coronavirus while people are sort of looking the other way. Yeah, I've had conversations about AI and surveillance and other technologies, <clears throat> how these policies that are being enacted now will just continue after the pandemic, whether or not there's the same threat. And I imagine that's the same case for immigration, especially if the Trump administration continues for four more years. And it's really clear. I mean, if you think about it, it's really clear. I mean, they're they're saying that they want the company, the company, they, that they want the country to reopen. Um, but they're saying, oh, but these immigration policies have to stay in place indefinitely, um, which is, a, you know, it's just so explicit um, about what they're trying to do. Uh, if you think it's safe enough for the country to reopen, and there are very few documented cases of of migrants bringing in coronavirus to the United States, especially because the border is essentially closed. I mean, immigration has ground to a halt. Um, what, then why did those policies need to continue to be in place? Um, uh, you know, so it, it's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, you can say that about a number of decisions this administration has made. Uh, so just to finish up, on a somewhat different note, uh, you were recently in Minnesota covering the George Floyd protests and uh, the memorial, I believe. Um, and a lot of the same issues that migrants deal with on, on the border in these refugee camps, um, they're somewhat similar to uh, a lot of what black and brown people suffer at the hands of the police uh, because of police brutality, because of sy systemic racism. So I was just wondering, when you're out there in Minnesota, if, if, I mean, the connection is there for all to see. Did, did you, was that part of the protests at all? The a concern about migration. I know a lot of different issues are, are, are coming up. Is was was that part of the the protests at all that that you saw? Um, any any thought about immigration? How this how this uh, police brutality connects to that as well? I mean, there. Are there are certainly parallels, you know, I think as an immigration reporter, um, you know, I also re report on Homeland Security, which is, is, at least in other administrations has been more than, <laughs> more than immigration, um, and national security. Um, so, you know, in, in one way or another have reported on, usually on federal law enforcement, um, not necessarily local law enforcement. Um, 
but there were a lot of things that sort of came to my mind as I was in um, Minneapolis. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about um, Minneapolis, um, you know, undeniably uh, a very, um, um, Minnesota in particular, undeniably, uh, you know, a very white state. Uh, I think it's 85%. Um, when you get to Minneapolis, it's a much more diverse place than the rest of the state. Um, but in urban areas that you might think of, you know, it's still predominantly white. Um, but Minneapolis, um, the immigrant population in Minneapolis um, has e exploded. It's become a much more diverse place in a very short period of time. Um, and a huge part of that is that Minneapolis for a long time, for decades, has had a very welcoming attitude of refugees um, and East African refugees in particular. Uh, the Ethiopian community, the Eritrean community, the Somali community uh, in Minneapolis is huge. Um, and that was certainly an, an aspect of the protests. Um, there are a lot of people in the community in Minneapolis um, who have experienced uh, racism, um, you know, as, as people who are black, as people of color, um, but have also experienced discrimination as immigrants or as refugees. Um, and that it was a really interesting, um, that was really interesting for me. Um, and, and thinking about policing and their experience of policing, not just on the local level, but also on the federal level, um, particularly with the Somali community. Um, and that was sort of just reinforced when you saw what a intentionally significant role the Trump administration uh, asked, you know, um, Homeland Security personnel to play uh, in responding to the protests, um, mostly in Washington, D.C. Um, but, um, and to me, that just sort of, it, it sort of rolled it all, all together. Um, this idea of um, policing communities of color. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that was, it was certainly part of it. Um, and I think that's part of like the very fabric of and, and, and personality of and history of Minneapolis. Um, it's incredibly fraught, um, but it's also, you know, they, they do have a, a long history um, with immigration and welcoming refugees. So that was sort of a rambling answer, but, um, you know, and some of the, for example, some of the surveillance um, technology that was sort of utilized um, and, and not necessarily uh, exclusively or even, even predominantly um, to go after some of the people who were instigating violence at the fringes of these protests, but used against protesters. Um, and some of that technology, that surveillance technology, has really been expanded in the most dramatic way by immigration authorities, by Homeland Security. Um, you know, sort of license plates, readers, and facial recognition, and, you know, the helicopters that were flying overhead. Um, uh, that has been a part of the legacy of Homeland Security under the Trump administration. Um, so these things are very much, um, they're very much all tied, all tied together. Um, and I think that the administration itself, its own words and policies have, have made that clear. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember a few years ago, uh, defund ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, I think I'm having that right. That, that was the big, uh, the big slogan for a lot of progressives, a lot of people running for office. And that seems to have been replaced by defund the police. But I think, yeah, as you said, they're all connected. And I'm sure we'll see uh, ICE will have uh, it, it, its turn to be uh, targeted in, in protests and for people to really focus on it again, I think. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of that was around um, family separation, which as yeah. we know has not stopped. Um, it may not be on the scale uh, that it was at the time, sort of in the spring of 2018. Um, and I think um, we this, conversation in this debate about um, police reform, I think you can sort of look at, at, at that. I think you're right to draw that, um, to sort of draw that connection between sort of the, these movements. Um, and I think it is still a very real and, and open 
question as to um, what steps are going to be taken moving forward, I mean, particularly after November, I mean, what, what does that look like? Uh, even if there is a change in administration, how do you sort of roll, roll these things back um, that have an institutional history of, of disproportionate force or disproportionate justice um, results for people of color, whether immigrant communities or, or um, the African American community? Um, they have an institutional, obviously, uh, they have roots that in the institution in and of themselves that date back such a long time. Um, but the Trump administration has also leveraged those institutions. So what does that look like? How do you make changes that, that will actually um, get at the root? I think that's gonna be the conversation moving forward, both in the immigration sphere and in you know, in criminal justice, and, and those are very tied up together. I mean, immigration courts are under the Justice Department. Immigration judges work for the Justice Department. They work for the same um, administration that the ICE attorneys work for. Um, and many people have been arguing for a long time that that is a, a conflict of, of, of interest, that it puts sort of politics before the law. And so that it, it's very much part of the same conversation. Oh, lot to think about. Thank you so much, Molly. This has been great. Thanks for having me. Of course.